title of our lesson this morning, Is a Honeymoon Marriage Possible? Now you might be saying, why in the world are you preaching this? Well, one reason is because I've already preached it before over in Polishing the Pulpit. That's one of the things they asked me to talk about. And guess what? As far as I know, there's several people in this congregation who are married. So uh, you might be needing that. Have you ever heard that? Uh, we, we need to keep a honeymoon marriage. Everybody's heard of that, haven't you? And uh, Or I, I sure do wish we had a honeymoon marriage. Sounds like they don't have it anymore. And so we're going to ask the question, is a honeymoon marriage possible? Now, isn't it wonderful when a sermon can be started and finished in 30 seconds? That's just wonderful, isn't it? And that's kind of the way this sermon is. Is a honeymoon marriage possible? Yes, it's possible. When you first get married, a honeymoon marriage is possible. And then there's another answer, no. And this is where the moon comes into play. After 30 days, the first cycle of the moon in that marriage, honeymoon marriage is over. Folks, we could just extend the invitation and go home. Yes and no. Now that's a little bit of a funny part to it. But if I were asking the question, is a honeymoon marriage possible? Again, the answer to that question seriously is yes and no. So let's talk about two things this morning. Let's begin by defining this word honeymoon. You wonder, where in the world did that come from? The first time it was ever used, 1842. A man by the name of Samuel Johnson was writing to young people about marriage. And he was not using the word honeymoon in just this wonderful, glamorous way. What he was doing is telling young people that the honeymoon will come to an end. The tenderness, the kindness the love, the compassion, the stuff that I refer to as the ooshy gooshy stuff in marriage. It eventually comes to an end, he was telling young people. It's kind of like the full moon finally winds up as the new moon. And guess what? You can't see it anymore. It's not there. The Jews had a honeymoon period of one full year. Isn't that amazing? Deuteronomy 24 verse 5. When a man taketh a new wife, he what? He shall not go to war. He shall not what? He shall not engage in any business. That's amazing. For how long? Notice what it says. But he shall be what? Free at home one year to do what? I, I love that word. He shall cheer up his wife which he hath taken. Now, I'd like to know a little bit more about that cheering up, wouldn't you? Okay. wonder how long it took her before she was sad. Sound like right after the I do. <laughs> Let's talk about the historic roots of this word. Honeymoon. It's interesting, okay? It's really comes from the British from, the, from over in England. The young couple would be married, and immediately after they were married, they would take a honeymoon. And guess what? A honeymoon was a trip, but it wasn't a trip like we think of. They took a trip in order to visit all the relatives on both sides of the family who were not able to come to the marriage ceremony. What a trip. In other words, they went to this person's family member, to that person's family member, and they introduced themselves one to another. Since you couldn't come, this is Sally. This is my new bride. This is Jim, my new husband. And so they just introduced their husband and their wife to their family members. There's two other origins of this idea honeymoon. One is a, of Norse origin. Right after they married, they began to drink, drink a drink, and it was known as honey drink. It was drank for an entirety of a month. It was known as either mead or meg 
Bethlehem. And they drank that for entirety of a month. Now what's interesting about that is this. It was an intoxicating drink. So you get married, you realize you messed up, you get drunk. I guess, I don't know why they did that. Okay, it's crazy. And then there's another one, and it's referred to as a captive marriage. A man desperately wanted to marry a woman. So what would he do? He would sneak into the house, he would steal the woman, and he would take her captive for 30 days. At the end of 30 days... He would show back up to the family. The only problem was, she was now pregnant. And that meant what? They had to get married. Now, I don't know where the honey is in that at all, do you? But those are some of the origins of this 30-day or so honeymoon period. Let's talk about how honeymoon is used today. Three different ways it's used. Number one, it's used as that time when a couple goes on a trip right after they get married. Isn't that the way we use it predominantly today? Where are you going for your honeymoon? And they have this big trip plan, right? Going down to the islands. We're going to go off on a cruise somewhere. We're going to go off in some mountain and we're going to be remotely out there all by ourselves for maybe a week, ten days, two weeks, and we're going to experience the honeymoon. And then there's also that period of matrimony between the beginning of a marriage and when the marriage begins to change, right? Right? We had a honeymoon marriage for six months. Somebody says, well, that's longer than we had one. But you see, there's this honeymoon period when all is bliss, when all is good. Now, what's interesting about that, it's referred to as a honeymoon because honey is sweet. And moon because it usually lasts for the cycle of a moon about 30 days. And after that, when the second cycle of the moon passes, everything's different. You're not on your remote island. You're not on your cruise. All the bills for the wedding start coming in. You start learning all the bad habits of the person that you married. There's some failed promises that have come through. There may be even a pregnancy by that time and... Contentment begins to wane. Why in the world have I done this? The honeymoon is over. And there's a third way we use it, and it's this way. Any period of blissful harmony within a marriage relationship. Now remember our question this morning. Is a honeymoon marriage possible? It'd be interesting if I just put out some little three-by-five cards and had you write yes or no on those three-by-five cards and just get a poll, wouldn't it? Because I'm certain there's a few people who say, oh yeah, it's possible. And then I'd get a bunch of stacks of no's. It's not possible. And folks, the reality is this. A honeymoon marriage is not something that is easy to acquire. It is not something that is easy to maintain, is it? And the reason for that is what I refer to as honeymoon difficulties. Folks, after a couple gets married, there are many, many difficulties through which they go over the course of many, many years. And those are some of the things that we want to talk about in this particular lesson. What are some of those struggles? What are some of those difficulties and hardships? Well, one of them I refer to very simply as changes. Whether we like it or not, when we enter into marriage at the age of 20, 25, 30 years old, things are going to change in the next 20, 30, or 40 years, aren't they? And one of the things that's going to change is our physical bodies. 
I had a lady look at a picture in my office the other day of me about 20 years ago. She said, you don't look the same. I said, duh. I don't look the same, do I? You're going to change. I find it interesting in Ecclesiastes 12.1, we use that verse all the time to talk to young people. Remember now therefore thy Creator in the days of thy youth. And then we put a period there. And folks, we shouldn't because the reality is, is that Solomon is not specifically talking to young people. Oh yes, he says to remember your Creator when you're young, but he gives the reason why you need to do that. While the evil days come not, nor the years draweth nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no joy in them. Folks, there's coming a day in old age when life gets hard doesn't it? Our bodies don't function the same. We don't look the same. We're going to have ailments. We're going to have aches. We're going to have pains. And we don't know at what point in life all of those kind of things are going to come upon us. Paul refers to himself in Philippians 9 as Paul the aged. We will not always stay young. And the fact that we change even in the aging process, is going to make our marriages somewhat different. Are our interests going to change? Oh, yes. Kathleen, she looks at me and she says, you you used to just love to make your car clean and fresh and nice. You know, that's work now. You You get out there and you work an hour or two, you're sore when you get done, and it rains on it within 24 hours. What is that all about? And I look at her and I say, you used to love to do housework. (laughs) And you used to love to cook. That all changes after a while. Kids gone. You know, I know who she cooked for. It weren't me. Folks, things change, do they not? In a marriage relationship, our interest. You may start off loving to golf and you go out and you golf all the time and then all of a sudden a man just puts his clubs down and he sees them in the garage and he tells people, I haven't used those in 20 years. What happened? Your interests change, doesn't it? Happens all the time. How about this one? Do our homes change? Oh yes. Folks, children come into that home. Just one baby can change the entire complexion of a household, can it not? Sometimes we change the place where we live. I grew up 24 years in Memphis. And I've only been back there as far as living maybe for about two or three years since then. Forty years. And as far as I'm concerned, I really don't care to go back to Memphis. But that's that's what I call home. But I don't want to go back there. Been to a lot of places. Been to towns Little bitty towns, big towns. Life changes, doesn't it? Sometimes parents come into our home and have to live, don't they? They're sick, they're elderly, they need our attention, they need our care. And so we bring our parents into the home. Does that change the complexion of a home? Absolutely, it does. So sometimes changes within our homes, whether it be our physical bodies, our relationships, whatever it is, folks, It makes our homes just not the same as when we started. How about this next one? Struggles within the home. Sometimes there's struggles financially, aren't they? Do you know finances are still the number one cause of divorce in marriage? It's amazing, isn't it? I'm thankful that right now I am not a parent that has three or four kids in my house. I can't imagine having to go out and buy a house today at the price that they are. I can't imagine trying to feed a family of four or five kids on today's salaries and the prices of food. How about gas? How about how much cars cost now? How much it costs to go out to eat? Hundreds and hundreds of dollars. Sometimes Kathleen and I go to Walmart and spend $150, $200 and we can both tote it out together. We don't even have to put it in a basket. And we don't eat that much, folks. 
What is in those bags? I don't know. It must be the bags. Because it sure ain't what I got. That's a hard thing for you folks. How about arguments in the household? Can you imagine in Abraham and Sarah's household the discussions and the conversations and the arguments that they had over Hagar and Ishmael? Do you remember when Job's wife came to him and she asked him, Wilt thou maintain thine integrity? Just curse God and die, she says. Well, that's a happy conversation. And I'll guarantee you, every home has had their fair share of arguments and strife within that home, haven't they? Folks, sometimes there's mental health struggles, aren't there? Things we don't anticipate, things that we don't plan, depression, anxiety, abuse, all kinds of issues that can rise within the home. They weren't that way when we were 20, but they are now that way at the age of 40. You don't think that takes a toll on a household? You don't think that interrupts what we refer to as the honeymoon bliss? It does. And sometimes within homes we find somebody who doesn't want to mature, do they? Maybe it's the wife. She matures. She has to take care of those little children. She has to feed them. She has to clothe them. She takes care of them when they're sick. And the husband, he just wants to be a boy still. He wants to go out with his friends. He wants to go hunting. He wants to go golfing. He wants to go fishing. And he just doesn't want to grow up. I've seen a few husbands like that. There's a word that describes them. Useless. And the wives would say, Amen. But folks, those kind of situations in our home make it very difficult for that honeymoon bliss to continue. How about this one? Relationships. We may mention the fact that children come into the home and sometimes that child has a severe health issue doesn't he? Or she. And that causes all the attention of mom and dad to have to be spent predominantly on that one child. And the other children either have to respect that or they get upset with that, don't they? Sometimes we find favoritism in the home. Remember Joseph and his coat of many colors? Sometimes in our homes, children are not the little angels that we brag they are to others. They're tough little kids. Get them up to be about 13 or 14 years old. They don't want to obey. They don't want to mind. They want to do their own thing. And sometimes their own thing ain't good things. And you have to bear with that three years, four years, five years, sometimes ten years. Folks, that's tough. You know it. Changes the home. Sometimes there's some spiritual struggles that happen in those homes as well. What about family? Can in laws and outlaws cause problems in the home? Oh, yes. Severe problems in those homes. Aunts and uncles can cause problems within the homes. Grandparents can cause problems within the home. And then we have friends as well. We get married and this person has their friends and this person has their friends and guess what? Sometimes friends can cause problems in the relationship of a marriage. How about this one? Marriage skills. Either they're not learned, that's the big problem, or they're not applied or both. What are some of the skills they need? Financial planning. I'm amazed that when you go through 12 years of school, there is not a required class on finances. Did you know you don't, you don't have to take a class about finances? I never did. Especially finances in the home. Talking about what? Budgeting, spending, saving, debt. Folks, there are homes today that have hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of debt. 
I heard of a college just the other day, $75,000 a year. Undergraduate college, four-year degree. You graduate, somehow you've coughed up 300 grand. That's a pretty nice house somewhere, you know it. That doesn't include all your living expense. That's just tuition. Can you imagine? And guess what? Kids want nice cars. They want nice furniture. They want a nice house because that's what mom and daddy had. It's easy to get into hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of debt, isn't it? How about this next one? Communication. That's something else that interests interest me. I went through 12 years of school, 4 years of college, and was never taught how to communicate. Never. How do you talk to one another? How about this one? How do you listen? We don't know how to listen to one another. In most marriages, oh yeah, we know how to listen. No, we don't. I went through counseling. They trained me how to listen and I still can't do it. And Kathleen said amen. It's true, folks. We don't know how to communicate with one another. We don't know how to problem solve. That's a huge marital skill. Oh yeah, we know how to argue and we know how to blame but for some reason, we don't know how as two grown adults to sit down and problem solve with one another. Simple things. At least they seem to be simple, but they're not. Marital skills. How about this one? Bad habits. Do they ever creep up in a relationship? Somebody likes to be bossy. Somebody likes to curse a lot. So I likes to watch TV computers and do their games. Old man don't like to pick up after himself. Just leaves a trail of junk from the door all the way to the bathroom. Mom just picking up after him all the time. Not helping with the children. Somebody who's stingy. One of the mates likes to flirt a lot. Another one thinks that he or she is superior to the other one, folks. Every one of those are horrible habits that can destroy relationships and marriages. How about this one? No time for marriage. Oh yeah, we have time for our career. We have time for business. We have time for our hobbies and for our sports, but we just don't have any time for one another. Sin can enter the home, can it? And folks, some of the sins can be quite severe, can't they? Drinking, drugs, pornography, adultery, dishonesty. Any one of those things can alter a home in a drastic way. There's also problems as far as spirituality in the home. Let's talk about four realms of difficult spirituality. How about this one? One makes faithful and the other's not. Oh yes, they're both Christians. But one is faithful. One wants to do what God wants him to do or her to do. And the other one could care less whether they're faithful or not. Is that a problem? Oh yes. How about this one? Both individuals go to church services, but only one of them has a real spiritual interest in the Lord's kingdom. The other one goes through the motions, does some of the things that needs to be done, but isn't interested, could care less as far as spiritual things are concerned. You think that causes some difficulties? Oh yes. How about this one? One becomes a Christian after they've been married for some time, but the other one doesn't. Man, now that's a toughie. You know what? Or this last one. You married a non-Christian, hoping that you convert that individual. 
And guess what? They never do. Every Sunday, every Wednesday, every time there's a work of the church, guess what? It's hard. And oftentimes, you're put into situations where you have to make decisions, don't you? Am I going to appease this person or am I going to do this work of the church? And it gets hard on individuals because home life can be made pretty miserable just because you make a decision for the Lord. Difficulties, folks. I want you to think about this. The marriage begins, right? Two people love each other. And there's that honeymoon bliss at first, isn't there? Oh, there's this tenderness, there's this affection, there's this fire, all this romance and everything, and then 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years pass. And you go through all the struggles, don't you? All the changes that happen in life and to the home, all the struggles, the arguments, the fights, the difficulties, the strifes that can arise from all kinds of places affect the home. There's relationships that impact the home, good and bad. We find too that there's no skills that these individuals bring to the table. They don't communicate, they don't solve problems. There are financial issues. They develop these bad habits and rather than get rid of them, those bad habits oftentimes just get worse and worse. There's no time put into the relationship. There's sin that's found in the home. And then there's that struggle over spirituality. You ask me, is a honeymoon marriage possible? After 5, 10, 15, 20 years... You see, that's what we're asking, isn't it? And sometimes individuals want you to think that, yeah, you can have that still. <coughs> Folks, because of all this stuff right here, there are many, many different views that people take about marriage, aren't there? Some marriages, because of those things come to an end very, very quickly. There are marriages today that end three, year, three months, six months, 12 months, 24 months after an I do. Three months? Are you kidding me? What happened to the honeymoon bliss? Because on the day of marriage, guess what? They would have told you, Oh yes, look at us. Three months later, it's gone. Individuals involve themselves in multiple marriages. Three, four, five, six marriages. Looking for what? We're looking for honeymoon bliss. You'd think after three or four, they'd get the message, wouldn't you? I studied with a woman once. She'd been married three times and her husband married five. And folks, that's not uncommon in the United States of America. Or how about this one? Individuals just choose to live together rather than get married. Right? I ain't getting married. I see what happens to all them people get married. We just live together as if that's the solution to the problem. Or this one. The opponents of marriage. And folks, let me tell you what. Our society today is making a significant shift away from, the mar from home and marriage. Did you know that? Significant shift. And part of it lies in the LGBTQ community to, and the arguments being made to try to sustain that particular culture in our society. And one of the arguments that they'll make is this. Marriage is no good. 
Look how many people who marry and divorce. Look how many individuals who are in a marriage and they're not happy. Marriage is not a good thing. It's sad, isn't it? It's sad. What exists at the beginning of a marriage is almost impossible to maintain after 10, 20, 30, 40 years of marriage, folks. And anybody who tells you that it can be, I don't believe is telling you the truth. People say, boy, Vic, you're, you're presenting a pretty negative view of marriage. Here's what I find interesting. If you really understand marriage, you don't want a honeymoon marriage. Not if you understand marriage. Then what do you want, Vic? Here's what I want. I prefer a heavenly marriage. Don't you? What do you mean by that? I prefer a marriage that is God-ordained, that is God-approved, and that is governed by the authority of the Almighty God. That's what I prefer. Most God never promised us a honeymoon marriage. He never said that. But He did promise us a marriage wherein we can be happy, wherein we can be fulfilled, wherein we can be content, wherein we can grow, and wherein two individuals can help one another reach eternity's gate called heaven. Now you might say, well, how do we do that? Well, that's part two. Because if not, we'd be here for the rest of the afternoon. But it is. Next week I have a gospel meeting over in Pensacola at the Leonard Street Church of Christ. But two weeks from now, when I get back, that's what we're going to be talking about. Biblical principles, biblical concepts, biblical laws that ought to govern our marriages. Folks, what do you want out of marriage? A godly, heavenly home, not a honeymoon marriage. I find it interesting that our Lord took marriage and made it applicable to the relationship that He sustains with the body of Christ. Romans 7 verse 4, that ye should be married to another, even unto him who is raised from the dead. The Apostle Paul says that he espoused us as an unchaste virgin unto one husband, and that is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The very minute that a person obeys the gospel, in a spiritual sense, that person is married to the Lord Jesus Christ. And we ought to be able to take that relationship between Jesus and the church and make application of that to our relationships here on earth. Just think if you're not a Christian... You've never obeyed the gospel. Folks, you don't have that marital relationship with the Lord. Do you need to do that this morning? The plan of salvation is simple, isn't it? Hear the gospel. Romans 10, 17. Believe in Jesus as the Christ. Romans 5, 1 and 2. Repent of your transgressions. Acts 17, verse 30 and 31. Confess the name of Jesus, Romans 10, 9 and 10. And be immersed into Christ for the forgiveness of sins. Acts 2, verse 38. Have you done that? We want you to this morning. In our ladies' Bible class, we just got through studying the book of Hosea. 
Hosea was commanded by God to marry a wife who would eventually commit whoredoms, who would eventually become an adulteress. And he did, a woman by the name of Gomer, the Bible says. And she did that. And the reason that he did that was to teach lessons through his prophet. And the lesson is this. My people whom I have married can commit spiritual adultery against me, the Almighty God. Think about that. We as Christians can become unfaithful to the God who loves us beyond measure. When that happens, we can repent. Hosea brought Gomer back into a husband-wife relationship after he divorced her. And folks, the Lord will take us back after we've committed spiritual adultery against Him. Maybe you need to do that this morning by repenting of sins, asking God to forgive you. You need to respond to this invitation. Won't you come as we stand and sing?